Now I often get paramedics say when we do a debrief, they say, you are, you are really calm. It is absolutely a facade. She could have simply got up and walked out and she would have survived, but she stayed there frozen and he eventually shot and killed her. And a few years later, I was working uh, on the ambulance helicopter and we went to a case where we eventually performed an amputation of a man's leg. Going back and writing about all those cases that had bothered me um, throughout my career probably ultimately saved my mental health. That experience was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. And despite 37 years of ambulance, the, 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 the scenes of that will probably haunt me more than anything else. Just on a quick note before we get into the podcast, I would really appreciate it if everyone could like, subscribe and share the podcast with anyone who may be interested as this will help it grow as large as it possibly can. Thank you. So Darren, you have been a paramedic for over 32 years. You've been a lecturer in the paramedic science, if that's what you want to call it, for 26 years. Um, rescue, ambulance, helicopter, intensive care paramedic, all these different things very intense job but why do you do what you do well i guess it's a good question um i think i think my sort of industry draws a particular type of person who likes to be challenged i think that uh the people that i work with tend to like the responsibility i think they we are a group of people that tends to thrive in the chaos um and uh there is, there's, without question, there is, there's some a stubborn side of it of being knocked down and, and refusing to 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 falter and just getting up and, and trying until you're successful. So I think the people that I'm working that I work with are a very driven group of people, and uh, they don't tend to take no for an answer well, and um, you know that they that they're happy to to engage with adversity and failure and and embrace that in some respects. And I think that uh, failure and um, disappointment can be a driver for people in, in, in high fidelity employment. It doesn't matter whether it be in sport or in health or whatever it is. But, um, you know, look, I, I've had a, I've had a wonderful career. I found it terrific. The, the sad thing for me is it's about to come to an end. I'm, I'm not that far away from finishing, but, um, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful time. And, you know, being in health, I think having an opportunity to, to be in a job that, um, can help people. Um, I think there, there's some incredible reward to be had that. I think there is the, the other side of it that makes it can be a very challenging uh, a sort of vocation, I guess. But um, I still think that uh, if you can find a way to balance the positives against some of the negatives, it's, it can be just a super rewarding career. So you said that at the start, it's, it takes a specific type of person who you know wants to get into this type of role. So what was the initial thing that drew you to this kind of career path? I, I guess I was introduced to it from a fairly young age. I had a next door neighbour who was a paramedic, and uh, for, you know, from when I was like two or three years old, and that was where the interest, uh, I guess, was born. But I think that a lot of people come into health and don't necessarily want to go down that that pathway of going into the higher acuity areas. But I, I, I think I'm just a person that's driven and. Um, you know, wants to be the best I can at, at pretty much anything I do. So whether it's, you know, building a chair or um, learning to play the guitar or whatever it is, I, I'm, I'm a pretty driven person. I think there's some of our people are a little bit wacky. Um, that sort of, um, there is an, a bit of a mad element to some of the people I work with. And I put myself in that sort of, maybe a little bit of autistic, or, you know, a bit, bit of autism um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I just think that that's where it was sort of started for me. Um, I never really thought that I would end up at the sort of point in, I guess. Um, I've always sort of suffered from a bit of, I guess, um, imposter syndrome. I still, I still find that a bit of a challenge um, in, in different things that I do now, but um, no, I've been very privileged to get to where I am in terms of the ambulance system. So when you start out and obviously you've applied for the job and you go into initial training how does that work as a whole so take me through from the moment the job gets accepted to then your first day on the job what happens in that intermission stage well it, it's different now than it was then so back then it was uh, you applied you're accepted to an ambulance service and there was in victoria there were six at the time and then you would go and do um, block education at our college. We had our own standalone college. 
and uh, you would do six or seven weeks in college, then you would do a block on road with a supervisor or a clinical instructor, and then you go back and do another couple of months at school and, and so on and so forth. Very different now. So we've gone down the pathway of having, um, you know, uh, education um, side of things is ticked off before people um, can get into the business. And, and there's some pros and cons to that system. Um, you know, the, the harsh reality, I think, for people is that, you know, right now there's about 5,000 people studying paramedicine in, in, in Australia and there's not 5,000 jobs going to be out there. And so with that comes some enormous disappointment for people um, if they can't find their vocation. But, um, you know, it, it, it was, uh, you know, for me, um, I, I, I'd wanted to do that job since I was the first memory I have. I, I, I was driven. I wrote to the ambulance service when I was 16 and, and, and asked them about how I should map my careers in terms of trying to, to gain employment. And that, the, the theory back then was that they wanted tradesmen. So I, I had to go and do a trade. I became a fitter and turner. I hated every second of it. It was terrible. Um, it did make me sort of practical, I think, and it, but it, but most importantly, it gave me some life experience. And even when I joined when I was 21, I, the minimum higher age was 21 and um, I was a very immature 21 year old and I'd lived a very very sheltered life and um, it was an incredible big um, sort of culture social shock to me to see the reality of the real world if you like and I think that most young people would find that as well. The, so you said that you obviously had to go and get a trade and you did that was it for five years prior to becoming a paramedic is that right? No, so in my time it was in blocks, but in today's world, uh, most paramedics will spend, um, you know, depending on the model and, and which state you're in, but uh, two to three years of education at university and then you can apply to a system. Um, and for most people, it tends to take at least 12 months to get a job, um, and some people that can be even a bit longer. But it's all about the cycle of the ambulance services. It really is a niche industry because. Um, there are only a few employers and like there's really only one in each state if you want to go into mainstream. So um, it really is about where that opportunity for employment lies. So it's, um, it's a tough road for young people now coming into the job. It's interesting that because in the UK they have a real problem with employing anyone into the health services. Whereas here it seems like it's a very favourable job to go into. I think... If you looked at the ambulance system in Australia, as opposed to pretty much everywhere else in the world, we, we certainly, in the pay scale, we're, we're very well um, paid here. And in fact, if the first, the, the employment, uh, the, the pay rate for a first year out of a uh, university student is $100,000. There's no, my son's a doctor, he won't earn that in his first year as an intern. So I think the uh, what's attractive in that respect, as opposed to the UK, is the, the, the remuneration, um, and we do um, we have uh, ten weeks leave a year, which again that's pretty unusual. And uh, you know, a lot of paramedics go to the UK from Australia because we're they're an attractive product because they're pretty well trained. Um, you know, a lot of them that do go there stay there and come back because they you know if you go and work in London, a good friend of mine went over and worked in London for a couple of years, and you just you simply don't make enough money to live. Uh, and the works works not as different. The system ambulance system is not as good. It's not as it's not as modern. It's not as um, uh, you know the opportunities don't exist uh, in places like UK and, and you know the health across the world in how ambulances work in the system is being challenged. And you know when I started in in Victoria there was four hundred paramedics. I mean, but but. The, the reality was that people never, you broke your arm, you didn't call an ambulance, you just got in the yeah. car and went to, to hospital. So the workload is evolving and that, again, is a challenging era for young people because they, they go in thinking they're going to be going to car accidents and heart attacks all the time and that's certainly not the reality. It, it's so, like, in terms of from a UK standpoint, it's so hard to understand why they're so, I, I would say, mistreated because I've spoken to a few doctors since coming here who are from the UK and they're like, I could never go back because I actually get treated like a human. I get paid double what I got paid to do half the hours. You know, I'm allowed to take a holiday. I'm allowed to take a day off. Like, I just can't comprehend how 
the UK has gotten into such a bad position in terms of how they treat medical staff in comparison to places like Australia? Uh, I have a friend who's a cardiologist um, and he was trained in the UK and a, and a cardiology consultant in today's money would earn about $100,000. A cardiology consultant in this country would probably earn, I don't know, um, very conservatively half a million dollars, but probably more likely a million. Um, wow. And, you know, if you go into interventional cardiology, uh, you could probably double that again. So, um, but you're right, you know, the, the culture that has established in with these health systems um, is terrible. So the paramedics in the UK, as I'm sure you know, they, they go to their ambulance station with their lunch and their thermos and they get in the ambulance and they leave and they hope to come back somewhere near their finishing time and hand the ambulance on to the next person. Um, Australia is starting to go down that pathway where, you know, the expectation is that you're just going to get in the ambulance and work for 14 hours of a night. That's probably not sustainable. We, we have 14 hour night shifts because historically there was some downtime. Um, that's changing. And, you know, the, the health system, as anyone who works in it would tell you, is under enormous pressure. Yeah, it's, it's quite hard to see how the future is sustainable in healthcare, particularly. Here. Yeah, I agree. So, I, I, so I, I'm so, somewhat fortunate. My wife is a, a nurse unit manager in the emergency department at Sunshine Hospital. So that would be one of the busiest um, uh, emergency departments in Victoria in terms of their throughput, um, not in terms of acuity, but they have a, low, a lot of low acuity work. They, uh, the demographic is, tends to be lower to middle class um, uh, population. But, you know, there's, it's just simple maths. If you've got 27 acute points of care in your emergency department and you get 90 ambulances a day, it, it, the maths just doesn't work. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I hear all sides of it, you know, from my wife about, um, you know, the, the pressures in her department and how, you know, patients, um, don't get best care because the system just cannot cope. And, um, I don't think anyone joins health to stand in a hallway next to an ambulance stretcher for six or seven hours. I don't think it's good medicine. I don't think it's good for the patient. Um, you know, in, in. Victoria, we've seen over 50 patients die on our stretches in hallways of hospitals. Um, that's, a, that's a terrible, it's a terrible thing. But, and, you know, no one in health is happy and pleased about that. And I'm, I'm with you. I, how we fix it and move forward is, is a really big challenge. And it's not one thing. It's not making, it's, you can't just keep putting more and more paramedics into the system. It is a complex system. It's about, you know, educating people about uh, health literacy it's about making bulk billing medicine available to people. Um, it's about making sure the right person goes to the right place. Um, we, well, I don't think we have that at the moment. I, th I think what I've come to realise a large problem within the, the system, not just in the UK, not just in Australia, but worldwide, is medicine is treated like a business and patient care is becoming, is well, increasingly treated like a business. You know, it's can we get patients in and out as fast as we can when actually some patients need to be there longer than what the business sees fit? Like, how do you deal with that from that standpoint where you, you know for a fact someone needs X amount of care, but the, the system saying, no, we, we need them in and out within like half that time? You know, I, I guess I'm a realist in that I understand that health is incredibly expensive and we could have a better health system. And I think in Australia, we have a very good one, despite how much stress it's under. If you compare it to other places, we could have a better system, but then we couldn't afford to have education or we couldn't afford to have roads. So the, I think the politicians run a very fine line of trying to balance the economics. And, you know, then you have that layer of politics getting in so you know how they use that as election promises etc etc that's complex and not our business but I think that um, more time money and effort needs to be invested in in looking at the bigger picture and how we address those things from from my point of view um, I think I, I'm very privileged I don't stand in lines the helicopter doesn't get ramped um, generally it does occasionally um, but usually there's hell to pay if it does because you just can't have that sort of in that assets sitting there ramped at hospital but I and I don't so I don't pretend to understand the problems but I think what I see that frustrates me in health is that 
you know, we, we use helicopters to fly people into hospital that are having acute cardiac events because we want to get them to a, to a, somewhere that is capable of doing an angiogram and possibly putting a stent in. And yet, even in with all the investment we've made, if you don't have, if you have your heart attack out of hours, the treatment you get is not the same as you would get in hours. So you're, if you are having a heart attack at two o'clock in the morning and you need to go to a cath lab, I, it's not guaranteed that you will go to one. And I find that terribly sad. Yeah, it's because in, so back home, when I was back home, I, I was sat with my, my grand one day and she's, she's 78 now and she started to have a stroke and I called an ambulance and they were there within, I'm going to say five minutes. It was really, really lucky. But I've heard of stories where, you know, because of the backlog, because they're so understaffed, the, the people are waiting like hours for an ambulance to turn up for, for really critical conditions. And I, I'm not just seeing it from the, you know, the family's perspective of this, you know, it was mistreatment. There should have been someone there to save them and all that. I'm seeing it from the point of view of a paramedic because you, you obviously care. You all obviously care about what you do. You care about the patients who come into your care. So then to feel like, you know, you hadn't done enough, even though you're overworked doing stupid hours, it, it must be so hard to deal with those kinds of situations. Well, I, I guess, you know, from my side of things, um, so, so we do two types of work. So we do primary work, which is about half our work, and we do what's called secondary. And so that's from taking a person from a regional hospital to a, to a tertiary hospital, so one of the bigger hospitals in Melbourne. And that, that equates to about half of what we do. I think for me, it's, it's in the same vein as what I find terribly frustrating is that you have a person who goes into a small regional centre and sits there for five or six or seven or eight or 12 hours. And it's only when things have gone terribly awry and the patient's declining and, and in terrible condition that we get involved. Um, and, you know, you walk in the door and say, OK, you're, you're in regional Victoria, a tiny little hospital where a person is, who's been hit by a car at high speed, that person's never staying there. They're, they're never going to have their, uh, all their health issues addressed there. Yet you sit there and often you're misguided in addressing what you see as the priority and you're missing the bigger picture. And then um, that happens. I, I, I find that a terrible struggle. I find that I have a, a terrible bias against that and it's something that I have to really contain when I go to hospitals of, you know, not walking and just saying, why are we here now? Why weren't we here five hours ago? Um, I think those frustrations exist in all levels of health for all staff, nurses, doctors, um, uh, paramedics. And uh, if you asked, if you interviewed them all, certainly if you sat down with my wife, she would, she would tell you about terrible frustrations she has about patients. She, she's the nurse unit manager of Short Stay, which is associated with the emergency department. So her patient cohort is patients that are going to be there from four hours to 24 hours. And, you know, once people breach... 24 hours in the emergency side of things, the hospital will get a fine. But after they've braced that, there's no find the next day or the day after. So what happens, and this happens in hospitals all across uh, Victoria, is that, that people um, are staying in you know, emergency departments for days. Um, there's not enough healthcare beds every day. Every, every emergency department in Victoria, in the tertiary hospitals, Whatever, how many, if they have 30 or 40 acute points of care, I guarantee you every one of them has five or six psych patients in those, um, those beds. If you're a psych patient and um, you know, you, you, you've got some mental health issues, being in a busy emergency department for four or five days can do nothing for your mental health. So yeah, I think, as I said, I think that uh, if you spoke to everyone in health, all of us would have a gripe about where things could be better. But the reality is, as I said earlier, we could have a better system of health, but then we couldn't afford to educate our children or we couldn't afford to build roads. So it is very much a juggling act um, for, you know, the governments at, at the top end and, and then how the services or the healthcare networks spend their money. So, um, um, yeah, look, it's, it's challenging. So... Let's bring it back to your first day on the job as a paramedic. <laughs> how, 
did you feel throughout the day? And actually, how during so your first call out as a paramedic, as a qualified paramedic, how did you feel? Were you anxious? Were you nervous? What was going on? So 37 years ago, um, car accident on a bridge in Geelong, I could take you to the exact spot of cars, ran into another car. It was relatively a minor car accident. Um, the lead up to that night, I don't think I slept a wink. Um, I, I was so anxious. I was terrified. Um, I was excited. Uh, and, you know, I was just... You know, I put the uniform, I remember in the morning I put the uniform on and I stood there and looked in the mirror standing in my uniform. I was just so incredibly proud to wear that. I still do that to this day. I still walk past the mirror and go, how privileged am I to wear this uniform? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was working with a guy called Ron Bart. We went to this accident. It was very minor. I don't think there's much wrong with the lady at all. I had no idea what I was doing. I couldn't do a blood pressure. I couldn't take a pulse. Um, I probably couldn't, I didn't remember what my name was. Um, I was just so overawed by the whole experience, but um, it's, it's burnt in my memory. I drive you know, over that bridge uh, occasionally and I always reflect back upon that moment and it was the start of a, a really wonderful journey. So fortunately, the next job I remembered my name and from there onwards and upwards. Like in most jobs, you go through your education and you get to the end of the education and then you get to that first day on the job and there's always that feeling of, I have no idea what I'm doing. But gradually you do get to a point where you're competent in what you do and you feel confident going to deal with situations. So for you from day one, how long was it thereafter where you started to be like, I can deal with this, I can, you know, I'm capable of doing what I'm doing? I'm still working to that day, Ethan, I'm hoping it'll come soon. Um... I think, you you know, I think within a relative short amount of time, you, you, you would go to work thinking, uh, you know, I have some idea to that level where you feel absolutely confident and competent. I, I, I truly don't think you ever get there. And I think if you do, you're probably, depending on how you, you reflect upon that confidence and competence, um, you might be in a bit of trouble. But that's that's the beauty of working in health and medicine because it's despite it being a science it's actually not an exact science um and you know it can be a confounding complex world and and the moment you think you've got it and you've got it all worked out uh it will pull your pants down so you know you can you i i this it's so easy to make a mistake in this field it's so easy to cut a corner it's so easy to have a complex presentation that's you know, bizarre and left field. So you're always being challenged and you're always being challenged to learn to become better. So, um, you know, I, you know, I work on the helicopter. I think most of the people that you would, that, that I work with would, in terms of that balance of being confident, we probably would prefer people to be slightly overconfident. Um, and I think most of the people I work with probably fit that um, that banner. I, I guess if you spoke to some of the general paramedics, maybe they think that we're all very overconfident. I'm not sure, but um, most of us have a little bit of that, um, uh, you know, that imposter syndrome I spoke about earlier. So most of us still have anxiety. Um, you know, look, I worked night shift and got just two nights ago and got sent to what sounded like an incredibly sick and complex patient, little, a little baby that had ingested some uh, really dangerous medication, um, accidental ingestion, and um, you know, I was going to a country hospital, didn't have a doctor in it, so I was gonna be a nurse, some paramedics and myself sorting out a very complex situation. So that creates some anxiety. Um, you know, you, you, if you weren't anxious about that, there'd be something wrong. So um, yeah. I don't really have an exact answer for you, Ethan, on that one. High pressure situations like that, how have you learned to deal with the anxiety and the pressure? How do you perform? Um, cognitive load theory is something I'm pretty passionate about and um, it's something that I teach and something that I you know, do conferences on. So a, a lot of the, I guess the lessons that I've learned have come from aviation about um, just having really, really, really solid systems. So I, the fundamentals are that you have a high degree of competence and, and you know, you, you train and you are skilled at the particular skills you want to burst. You also do some training in high cognitive load theory. So you put yourself in situations where you're under high cognitive load. Training environment's your best friend. 
Um, you know, I really subscribe to the theory about understanding your disaster personality, so knowing exactly what happens to you when you're under high cognitive load. Um, and I think that once you have a bit of an understanding about what happens to you in those situations, about how you manage, you know, situational awareness, how you manage task focus and how you communicate and how you lead in those situations. Once you know where your areas of concern are, you can put some uh, systems in place to help uh, manage those. Um, having, uh, you know, robust processes and systems that are learnt behaviours, not something that you need to think about to do, that, that you have such a high degree of competence in those systems are your friend. I think about, uh, you know, making sure that you understand what your failure points are and how you communicate in those situations. And, uh, you know, for me, um, in high cognitive load situations, I have a propensity to become a quiet talker or a mumbler, as people uh, point out to me. So I know that, so I address it. So I put a system in place to how I, I probably overshare information. Um, uh, but, you know, the fundamentals of, of managing uh, any sort of work in high cognitive load is really about understanding what happens to you in that situation. And you know, I often get paramedics say when we do a debrief, they say, you are, you are really calm. It is absolutely a facade. Uh, there are times when I, I feel absolutely, you know, stressed and anxious and very concerned and deeply worried about what's going to happen to the patient. And, you know, in medicine, sometimes you want to perform treatments and you think there, there is great risk in performing those treatments. You could kill the person by doing them. But the, prob the, the, the issue is that there is infectious behaviours in, in how we lead a scene. And if you come into a scene and you are a screamer or a panicker or you become um, completely silent, um, you won't lead your team. And if you come in, and even if you're panicked underneath um, and or anxious or concerned, um, if you have that facade, it gives people belief and confidence and that composure is so important. So um, I think that... Um, by bringing that in, and, and as I said, I, I've had people say, "Oh, you are calm," and, and it's it's it is absolutely the duck on the pond theory. You know, underneath it is uh, everything's going a hundred miles an hour. But I understand the importance of, of the scene dynamic by bringing that calm and composure and, and, and giving that belief, and that, and that's how you build your team. You know, you you look around at your team, you you look at the tasks that need to be done, you exploit the skill sets of the people that you have there with you. You allocate your tasks based on priority, but you, you allocate them to the people that are qualified to perform them. You never try to have people that are uh, like our intensive care paramedics doing advanced life support skills. We, we wanted our intensive care paramedics to be working in their lane. And um, that's how you exploit your workforce. And, you know, the building of the team is such a critical component. And, um, you know, it doesn't always go well. You, you often set out and you think that this is how it should progress and you build your team. Sometimes you need to coach people. Sometimes you need to change the roles based on how people's um, level of competence and how they're performing. But it's a, it's a very, very complex world, I think. But a lot of it lessons are born, born from aviation. Um, and, uh, you know, in the 70s, um, cognitive load theory was really born when people became flying on planes um, because jet travel became affordable. But what happened at that time was that there was just so many crashes and uh, the scientist at, from NASA started reviewing black box data recordings and he found that, um, you know, there's a huge amount of cases where they, they, they had a terrible uh, authority gradients on the flight deck. So the pilots were in charge. No one could question them. Often there would be people on the flight deck that knew that were about to have an accident, but they never spoke up. They found that pilots quickly became cognitively overloaded and depending on their disaster personality, um, some of them became silent, they become frozen. Um, they realised that the greatest uh, accident in aviation history was when two 747s collided. One was taxiing and uh, entered a runway and the other one crashed on top of it. And I think 550 people were killed. The pilot that was taxiing the aircraft was worrying about an air conditioning duct that wasn't giving fan out cold air out to him on the flight deck and they were all focused on it so he became focused on that particular task lost their situation awareness and as a result those two planes come together and killed 500 people so you know cognitive load theory um, if anyone's interested in that stuff um, the, the the precursors to it are aviation and I've been really lucky I, I didn't really go my 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 theory about managing cognitive load really is not born from a lot of textbooks it's really from working with uh, pilots, largely uh, military pilots, 
they have such great systems and understandings about how they manage cognitive load and concepts such as load shedding and, and you know healthy um, authority gradients and crew resource management of those theories are, are born from those guys. So I've been really lucky in that space. So <clears throat> dealing with your own cognitive load, how, how do you, so you said there about the, you know, the duck and water theory where you, you're going 100 miles an hour under the surface and, surface and then it, to, to everyone around you, you seem calm and collected. But for, for a lot of people, that's such an unimaginable thing to be able to do because the anxiety just takes over. So how do you manage to get yourself to a position where you can control what is being portrayed to everyone else? There's a few, few, a few theories, I think. So first of all, train how you play. So put yourself in those positions in the training room. And so when we select our staff, we, we, we give them a scenario so, and we film it and we put them under huge cognitive load and then we overload them. It's a deliberate thing. So we'll give them some more information where they simply can't process the information. So they need to fall back to learnt behaviour. They need to fall back to their processes. That's step one. I think, you know, the other part about it is that understanding of, of your personality. Um, I use what you would call as a courage mantra. Um, so when I'm about to do it, so the most frightening thing that I would do in my world is put someone into an induced coma and particularly children. And sometimes, as I said, they might have such uh, trauma or they might have an illness that you think, I want to put this child into an induced coma, but there is great risk because of their injuries or their illness that they could die during this procedure. So I use a, a, a courage mantra, it's, it's a grounding technique, and um, I just simply push my feet in the ground and say to myself, I'm here, I'm now, I'm okay. I'm well trained, get on with it. And if I really feel that there's like there is, this is likely to go wrong or there's gonna be complications moving forward, I use, uh, a, again, a grounding technique that comes from Dale Carnegie, um, who wrote the book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he talks about, over and over in his book, he goes, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? And I, you know, I say that to him, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? There's going to be complications and you're going to deal with it like you've dealt with it before. But at the end of the day, tomorrow the sun will rise. And they're the two sort of courage mantras or grounding techniques that I've used and they've served me very well. And I think if you, if you ever watch me, you would see me rocking on the, the sort of balls of my feet in those moments and that is pushing myself and connecting myself uh, to, to the ground and, and reminding myself that I've been here before and I've done it and I'm going to be okay. Um, but again, I think, you know, the, the, the key parts of it are things like that, but it's, there's all these parts come together. It's about how you communicate. It's about how you build your team. It's about how you, we, we use a theory called disaster proofing. So we, when we do our setups to do that intubation, we think, okay, what's, what, what are the likely things to go wrong? And then we put those steps in place. And when we do our brief to our crew, we say, if this happens, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And if that happens, we're going to do A, B, and C. And your roles in that are all these things. So that discussion around what could go wrong is far better to have in, in the prelude rather than, uh, you know, as it's all falling and unraveling, um, it's far better to have that that information share so people know what their roles are and what's going to happen. You know, as I said, I think that um, in this high cognitive load or cog cognitive overload theory, uh, there's a thing called the amygdala hijack. So you get to that part where you simply can't process information. So you just simply can't do anything. Um, but if you've got good systems and processes, you've had a chat about what's going to happen, you've had a talk about what people's roles are, you understand what happens to you in, in terms of how you manage this stress. So I know, as for me, I am prone to, to suffering from task focus. I can, I can go off a rabbit hole and get lose situational awareness. I know that I can become a quiet talker. So um, they're my disaster personalities that are the risk in what I do. So I have in... in in the in a medical um, side of things, there is as you go through your uh, clinical approach, there's a, a comment where it says pause and plan. So in high acuity team, um, sort of high performance team stuff, that's called the disconnection, and that's the moment to take the 360 view. That's the moment to stop and say, hey, just quickly have a look around and make sure you're not missing the thing that's actually going to kill the person, and you're fo focused on something that's that's not important. 
So, you know, it is a combination of all those theories. So it's about how you communicate, understand what happens to you, disaster proofing, um, building your team, exporting your team, making sure you're getting the best out of your team. You know, often at an ambulance scene, what I've always struggled with is um, sometimes there can be 10 ambos standing there and what, the person, the team leader, is the one working and there's nine people standing there doing nothing. That's not good medicine and that's not good team management. So get everyone involved. And I'm constantly looking up, having that 360-degree view, but I'm also looking at who's standing there doing nothing, what can I get you to do, what are the next steps we need to do, how do we plan ahead? So um, that was a long answer to your question, Ethan, wasn't it? It's a great one, though. It's definitely a great one. Um, <clears throat> so then sort of on a side, if we go on a side note of that cognitive load, I spoke to a policeman last week and we were talking about if you don't prepare, so when you find out you're going to deal with a specific situation. So for him, he said his most common incidences that he would deal with were um, fatals. So, you know, people dead at the scene. So he'd be going to deal with them. And he said, if you don't prepare yourself for that situation on the way in, then it's going to take you down very quickly. So, for you, how do you prepare yourself for, because you're dealing with extreme situations, like probably some of the most graphic situations a human can see at times. So how do you prepare yourself to go into them and then perform at the highest level? I think, I think what the policeman has alluded to is a really important part. So managing task focus and, and high cognitive work environments so a couple of key things you do in that preparation side first of first and foremost so matt uh is it matt i'm trying to think of the he, he, matt he flies the red bull racer airplane so the, he has a really um great video about managing cognitive overload so he nearly crashed his red bull racer into a lake in wa so he talked about um compartmentalizing so when you're about to go into something you've got to remove everything else so you've got to have a really empty bucket so you can take on a, a high cognitive load so when you're going to a job you know for me going to a job I, i'm not thinking about my you know my marriage that's going bad my uh, you know kids that are being naughty um the fact that i owe money to this person or that person you must compartmentalize everything outside and just be managed on the task so you do that um mental um you know gymnastics about how you do that pre preparation so you start thinking about what this is going to look like what skills i might need what drugs i might need to use um so that preparation that mind preparation that you, you're doing is so so important um and it is about really getting you in the zone to be able to go into that into that situation and deal with that and you know, years ago, I used this as a teaching example, years and years ago, I was driving in Collingwood, it was in Smith Street, Collingwood, and they called me up on the radio, and I was in a little ambulance car with all the bits and pieces, and um, just by myself, and they said, oh, uh, you know, what's your location? We have an 18-year-old in cardiac arrest in Smith Street, Collingwood, and I went, oh, okay, and they went at 60, I, I literally stopped, and I was out the front, I was out the front of the house. Um, so I didn't have any of that preparation time. I didn't clear my mind. I didn't get myself into the zone, which is a high performance, you know, that um, getting into the zone type theory. I didn't do my normal preparation. I walked into the house and I walked into the house with all the gear and I found a young lady attacking an old lady with a telephone. So this is a long time ago, so it's not like an, not like an iPhone 4 or anything. It's, you know, the old-fashioned telephone where she was literally beating this woman to death with a telephone. So I've got a call for an 18-year-old cardiac arrest. I've walked in and here's a woman beating another woman with a phone. So I quickly intervened between the two women. And then all of a sudden, the young woman who's assaulting the older lady thrusts me an 18-month-old baby who's in cardiac arrest. So what, what the backstory was, and I obviously didn't know this at the time, and it didn't, I didn't learn it from, until much later, is that this house is a family daycare centre and that your young, the young mother has dropped off her 18-month-old baby to this woman to be cared for for the day. And when she's arrived to pick the baby up, the, the, the elderly lady that had the family daycare centre said, oh, the baby's having a really long sleep today. So they've walked into the bedroom where the baby is supposed to be sleeping but very sadly, this this baby has had a cardiac arrest. The baby had died of SIDS. Wow. And 
So you talk about in that cognitive load theory, so that, you know, we talk about the fight flight response, which is that amygdala hijack side of things. So this young mother's response to that situation was to fight as inappropriate as that was. And she attacked the poor healthcare worker and a uh, poor uh, family care worker. But that moment that they thrust this baby into my hands, so all the, all the calculations around how to manage children are all based on very simple mathematics. So age times two plus eight, age on four plus four. But at that very moment I've walked in and I've, com I've gone completely into cognitive overload. I've had this theory called the amygdala hijack. I can't process the information and I simply could not do the mathematics, like the most basic mathematics to work out the, the child's weight, you know, all the drugs, etc. that we would need. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. But what saved me on that day was the fact that I had such strong training and such strong conditioning that I immediately went into that resuscitation and began the CPR. And the, the beauty of that training is it's learnt. You don't need to think about it. You can automatically do it. Because from day one, you enter ambulance school and you fall back on that learnt behaviour. And it gives you that time where you start going through the cycling of the baby in cardiac arrest and all of a sudden the demand in your capacity, so the, the cognitive demand is reducing because you're now working out what's going on and your capacity starts to increase. So therefore, as you go along, you start to be able to get that ability to come back to do that. But that's a very, very hard thing to manage. And that for me, that was the first job where I went, I, don't, I just don't know what happened to me because I've never experienced that before. And that's when I first started looking into to theories of like cognitive load theory. And, um, and that's why I got interested over that one case. Um, and you know, that, that, yeah, the, well, the really sad thing was that the, the young mother um, who had taken that fight response, she'd fractured the woman's skull by hitting her with the telephone. It was so sad, you know, um, and the baby, the baby was deceased and, uh, you know, sad for the mum, but it's just a tragedy and a tragedy and a tragedy in that respect. But, you know, the lessons that I learned there about myself was that, and, you know, I, I, I just thought, how, how can I have lost that capability to do simple maths? And it's, it's simply your inability to process that information. So cognition is, you know, your ability to, to um, process information. Normally we don't have any problems, but when the information is in, in such volume or in such intensity, um, you know, we, we can have that overload and, and the fight flight response is a really interesting one for me. Again, that it sort of ties in and how I educate around that, that amygdala hijack, that cognitive overload theory. But, um, we would always, we would always call that the fight or the flight response. Um, so a few years ago, they added the freeze to that. And more recently they've added the follow. So if you think about, um, typically their acts of terrible um you know acts of violence that there are plenty of examples where you have that um you can see all those four uh, phenomena about how people uh, respond to incredible um you know confronting bits of information and um you know the uh the the, the hijacking of the planes in 9 11 the plane that was headed to the pentagon is a good example of how that follow response, whereas that they're on the plane, um, they're texting their loved ones, telling them that they'd been hijacked, but the loved ones are telling them that um, those planes have crashed into to the World Trade Center. It took one person on that plane to say, you know what, we're, we're all probably gonna die, but we can stop a lot of innocent death here if we take these terrorists on. And they got uh, food trolley and boiling water and attacked the terrorists and made the plane crash short of the Pentagon. So. That's the follow theory, but that was born from one person. So one person goes, I'm going to fight. And then, you know, 20 and 30 people said, I'll follow. Um, there's plenty of good examples about that, but that's, you know, um, that fight, fight response. But uh, we should probably have fight, fight, freeze and follow. Um, Lay down Sally, um, the Australian rower in the Olympics is a great freeze one where she had four years of training for the Olympics. And she's in the four man rowing, uh, four, four person rowing and the gun goes off and she just lies down and, uh, you know, she, she, she was just at, brutalized by the Australian public, the Australian people, and obviously her teammates, but she, she had a cognitive overload and her way of dealing with that was not to fight. She froze. Um, and she couldn't process the information. It was too, it was too overwhelming to her. So it's, you know, an interesting, um, 
interesting but very sad thing for her. I think it ruined her life, that incident. It's crazy because I had only heard of the fight or flight until now. And the freeze and follow makes so much sense because in terms of the follow, it just shows that, you know, throughout history we have leaders, leaders for everything. There's always one person who steps up yeah. that then causes the sort of knock-on effect to everyone else. And it's just like, it's so simple, but we, we're not quite, it seems like we're not quite aware of it sometimes that actually it does just take that one person to go, you know what, let's do this. And everyone goes, yeah, okay. Even though they've probably panicked and frozen. So I joined Ambulance in 1987 and um, found myself involved in this particular horrible, horrible case. And so a man called Frank Vitovich um, was a very disgruntled human. He had issues with everyone, his neighbours, all the services. You know, he was constantly at war with Telstra, the water board. He was a really grumpy man. He probably was some, had some sort of intellectual disability. But he had a physical disability as well, so he was unemployed. And he walked into King Street to what was then called the Telecom Building, which is today's Telstra, which then was a government-owned body. And he walked in there armed with a sawn-off twenty-two rifle and began shooting people. And back then, because it was a government building, they had security cameras. So this is 1997, so it wasn't a video. The camera took a photograph every six seconds. And so when you, when you put all those photographs together into a film, it looked like you know, a scene from The Thunderbirds, so it was stilted. But because I was involved in that case, I, I saw all that, that vision um, um, play out. And he walks in and begins firing and shooting people. And many of the people run away, so they take flight. But he walks up to the desk of a young woman who, who was a, the centre manager and she's sitting at her desk and she's frozen with fear. What she doesn't know is that uh, Frank is largely disabled and um, that the firearm is in incredibly poor condition. And he stands at her desk for over a minute and a half trying to remove a bullet that's jammed in the rifle. And she sits there frozen and can't move for a minute and a half. She could have simply got up and walked out and she would have survived, but she stayed there frozen and he eventually shot and killed her. He walked upstairs and to the seventh floor and began shooting people. And one of the guys that was cowering under her desk said to his mate, he said, you know what, if we stay here, we're all gonna be killed. How about we take this guy on and maybe we, we, maybe we survive, maybe someone survives. We might get shot, but we'll take this guy on. And they went up and again, they didn't know that he was largely disabled and they very easily disarmed him and um, the official report was, I think, that he then jumped out the window. I'm not sure whether he jumped out the window or perhaps he was assisted out the window. But again, that's, that act of violence has all those, those theories. So the people ran away. The poor lady was frozen with fear. Uh, she was, you know, sit there. But again, it took one person to, to say, I'm in a fight. But then six or seven of his co-workers followed and they stopped that act of violence. And... Um, you know, as I said, I think the sad thing is to find examples in, that incorporate all four of those aspects generally involved a terribly violent act. Yeah, because um, you see, you know, the heroism in terms of the guys who've stopped the, the gunman, you have, you know, the, the tragic death, and then you have the ones who just instant panic and run away, like, because obviously they're, they're doing the right thing. They, you know, to run away from a situation to get to safety is completely the right thing. But, but then, like, a lot of it's well, involuntary at that stage, Ethan. So when you have that fight flight response, that's not something that you can sort of predict. But and and you think about it, it, it's actually your body's way of of trying to protect you. It doesn't always, and sometimes it makes you vulnerable. But you think about if you see a snake, you don't have to, and and you reel back in horror. You, you didn't think about doing that. You just did that. It was automatic. So that's your autonomic nervous system that does that for you. So again, the other side of it is that if, you, if you're a person that, that runs away from a stake, doesn't mean that you run away from a gunman. Um, how you react to that is really based on the, the circumstance. Yeah. But uh, it really is an interesting thing. And I think a lot of people that, in, that are in, in health, um, certainly the people that I work with, they would be the people. So if they, you know, if you think about 9-11, when that was all, uh, the buildings were collapsing, you know, as I said, I, back then I had a, my own little ambulance car. I, I'm sure I would have got in my car and driven into, if that had happened in Melbourne, I would have driven in there if I was off duty and, and tried to help. 
Um, and, you know, there would be many, many emergency services workers in 9-11 that, that, that were off duty that went in to try and help and ultimately played uh, the ultimate price because that's, but that's their, their personality. So, um, yeah, I, I find that all that stuff, um, that human behaviour stuff, I find that um, fascinating. It's interesting how people react. And I'm, I'm, I'm often perplexed why people, you know, even when people don't do well or they perhaps underperform or they fail, I'm really interested to understand what, why, why, did, why did you do that? Why didn't you do this other thing? And, and try and understand the machinations. And, and, you know, that if you think about, you know, where errors are formed, understand the latent failures, you know, because it's the active error. That's the mistake of, you know, not putting the bolt in the cowl of your helicopter and the helicopter, the cowl falls off when you take off. It's the latent failures that came in before that. So where does the failure, where is the failure, where is the error born is what I'm interested in. So it's super interesting. Yeah, it is. It is interesting, it's, it's, it, but it's dry. Not It's not everyone's cup of tea. Yeah. The So these situations that you've mentioned are, you know, quite horrific and probably hard to deal with. Do they stick with you throughout yes. your career? Yes. Yeah. How do you deal you with Certain them? things do, and you think about certain circumstances. And, um, you know, I think I started... I started in ambulance at a time when uh, mental health was, it was frowned upon. I remember a fellow that I worked with who was alleged to be a really good paramedic and he, you know, he drove around in the car division and he was the first ambulance to, to arrive to the Westgate when the Westgate bridge collapsed. He was the first ambulance to go to that scene and he never worked in an ambulance ever again. And, uh, you know, I'm ashamed to say that I just thought he was putting it on. I, I, I didn't believe it. I thought it was just all a bit fake and a bit phony. But I think, you know, you live it for 35 years and you, you, you certainly know it's real. And I, I'm pretty sure that anyone who works in my industry, particularly working on the helicopter where you're going to the pointy end all the time, um, you know, I don't think you get out of that without having some form of PTSD. There's being a team leader in the really high acuity stuff that, that that's another la level and layer. And sometimes, you know, you sit there and you, and cause you feel like the buck ultimately stops you. You might be with a team of people in a hospital or a scene and everyone looks for you for direction. So if it all goes wrong, it falls back to you. That, that, that added pressure in that scenario can be really taxing for some people. Um, what we see in my industry is a phenomenon we call the heebie-jeebies. So what happens is that people that get the heebie-jeebies start coming to work, panicked that the phone's going to ring. They get a job, they have a bit of a meltdown. Um, they, they have anxiety about even just driving to work. I, I remember a really good friend of mine telling me that he, every day he drove to work, he'd stop at about at 500 metres from our gate and he'd vomit. Um, you know, so the it, it, it can take a serious toll on people. Um, and, and, you know, I certainly, there's cases that I ruminate about all the time. And I, I've, I, you know, I, I wrote the book, um, I wrote the book around mental health largely. And um, it was about, it was a really cathartic process for me about um, managing my mental health. And it was, we, Julie and I and my wife went to Bali to get married and we got involved in the Bali bombing number two. And probably that experience is probably one of the worst experiences of my life. And despite 37 years of ambulance, the, the, the scenes of that will probably haunt me more than anything else. But that I first started writing based on that experience. And that's where it, the book was born. The writing process for A Life on the Line, was it almost like therapy to be able Absolutely. to just, just put it on to paper and get these thoughts out that have stuck with you for 30 years? Yep. That's it. That it very much. I, I never really, I, I don't think I gave it the, the true attention it was at the time, but I, Julie and I looked after a man uh, who was from WA and his daughter, so he, the poor man had terrible, horrific, life-threatening injuries and his daughter had been terribly burnt. But most tragically, their son, um, his son, uh, Brendan, who'd been killed in the Bali bombing, Terry survived, Terry Fitzgerald his name was, he survived the blast and he asked all the people that helped him um, through that, through the Bali, and there were many, there were many people, many links in the chain, to write um, a chapter for a tribute book to his son. 
And I was very troubled by Bali, and, but the sitting down and writing about it was incredibly cathartic to me. And um, it really did lift me out of that funk that I associated with that. And a few years later, I was working uh, on the ambulance helicopter and we went to a case where we eventually performed an amputation of a man's leg, which is so defiant of what a paramedic would do to do something that extreme. It hadn't been done in that circumstance in the state of Victoria before. Um, and we did that. And the ambulance service, who I would say has always been very a very good employer to me, and it's always looked after me, um, or generally looked after me in my mind, um, I thought there's probably some personality based reasons, but I was terribly mistreated through that process. Um, I was thrown under the bus. I was, uh, you know, people were going around saying some stuff about me, which I thought was terribly unfair. There was people making judgments about what we had done that had never even heard my story. And I, I found that terribly distressing. And, and the, the interesting root cause of my distress was not what we had done, because in my mind that was, and it still to this day remains the right thing to have done, to been done at the time. But what the most distressing thing in that thing that I worked out through the psychologist was the fact that I felt abandoned by my organisation, who I am loyal to, and I, you know, an organisation that I love. Um, that was the most hurtful part. But I, I went back and wrote. I actually stopped working because I got to a point. I thought I, I will never work in ambulance again. I'm, I'm finished. And I thought I was going to go down and end up in some sort of psychiatric institution, but um, the writing about that amputation case and then going back and writing about all those cases that had bothered me um, throughout my uh, career probably ultimately saved my um, mental health and, and my working, uh, you know, sort of role within ambulance. So that was very cathartic, that process. And, you know, amongst other things, you know, I've, I, I, I regularly see a psychologist and, you know, good people, family, support, friends, and things like that, they were all contributed, but the book was really powerful. The Bali bombings, for, for those who aren't aware of it, what just summarize what, what happened and why you were there. Uh, so we went there to get married. So I, I'd, been, I'd been married before, and um, I'd, I'd uh, met my, my now wife, had a couple of kids, and my first marriage was not particularly great, so the thought of being married again was a bit traumatic. Um, and, but she, and she was, she's just such a great human being. She said, oh, whenever you feel like you want to get married, we'll do it, but just do it on your term. And then one day I sort of woke up and I thought, oh, this is, it's not fair to, to her. You know, she, this is something that she would like. So, um, I need to put my big boy pants on and, and get over myself. So, um, we, but we, I didn't want to do the whole white, uh, you know, meringue wedding stuff uh, and neither did she. So we decided to go to Bali to get married. We'd arrived in country, been there only a couple of hours, and the second Bali bombing was committed. And really, there was a there's an interview of a fellow that was in Bali, and he was I remember it in Bali one where he was being interviewed by like Karen Affair or something, and he said to the reporter, "I knew I'd be okay because an Australian nurse came up and she said you're terribly burnt, I'm, but I'm going to stay and look after you until you get repatriated." And he talked about how that gave him, he, he, he believed that he was gonna be, he would live and survive because of that, that, that nurse. And so I said to Julie, you know, she's a nurse, 30 years experience in emergency. I was the same, let's go down and see if we can help. Um, we went down to the hospital in Denpasar and we looked after, as I said, Terry and Jessica Fitzgerald. Um, this, Terry's son, Brandon, was 16 at the time he'd been killed in the blast. Um, so I think we stayed, I would actually don't remember how long, it was 10 or 12 hours we, we spent in hospital. Um, Terry had been, Jessica had actually been pretty well managed, but Terry had been terribly under-resuscitated. So, um, you know, we walked into the intensive care and the moment we walked in, we were given complete and autonomous care of both of them, which is incredibly crazy. Um, you know, I had a little bong t-shirt on and rip curl shorts, and here I am, you know, resuscitating someone in an intensive care unit in a foreign country. And, you know, we, we, I would ask for drugs and they would just give me a box of it, you know, give me some morphine, here's a box of morphine, here's, um, wow. yeah, it's crazy. And, uh, but uh, Terry was very close to death when we met him and um, they there's, a, there's a, a Burns formula and they were very keen to show me that they had, they, they knew the Burns formula, which they had the formula correct. They just had their maths in terms of the fluid resuscitation uh, wrong and that the decibel point in the resuscitation of fluid was in the wrong spot. So 
Terry had really large percentage burns, so he should have received 16 litres of fluid in the first 24 hours, but they'd given him 1.6, um, and that was why he was, he was pretty close to death when we met him. But um, as soon as we asked for fluid, they gave us a box, and we just re began that resuscitation phase. Uh, we got his kidneys working, uh, he began producing urine, and ultimately he survived, but with terrible injuries. And, um, yeah, he, uh, he uh, asked... Asked me that that him asking me to write that uh, that book um, probably ultimately saved my career. I suspect. Yeah. Um, the, the funny story. I I wrote the chapter, sent it off, and didn't really give it enough thought. And Terry couldn't get published, so he self published. And uh, um, he sent me a copy of the book. And I I as I was walking to get on a flight to go to a conference in Queensland for ambulance, um, the book arrived. I thought I'll read it on the plane, and um, never really thought about how it would impact on me. But it was. It was like a dozen people that had helped Terry and Jessica and, and Brandon um, in that process that after the bombing it had all their stories and it, it just was, it just, every one of them, their lives were ruined by this experience. So that ripple effect of not just to, to Terry and his family, but all the, the two nurses that stopped and helped them, how they both, you know, lost their marriages, their careers and, and severe mental health issues and the family and friends that protected them the same and, uh, I'm on a plane going to Queensland and I burst into tears on the plane and um, the, the poor uh, flight attendant thought I was having some sort of mental breakdown. I'm, I think that I was wondering if there was going to be police at the other end waiting to arrest me and take me off the plane. But uh, it was, uh, it's, it's, it's a very sad tale. But, um, you know, there's also, you know, you take away some hope in that sort of stuff. And I try and find the positives in this stuff. And the positives were that um, the great Australian spirit so it lives that um that you know that they had this terrible experience but yet they had so many strangers come to their aid and help them and that's uplifting i hope you enjoyed part one with darren hodge incredible guy with some incredible stories with even more stories to come in part two so stick around until monday next week where you'll find part two with darren hodge coming at 3 p.m australian eastern standard time and 6 a.m greenwick mean time also, please remember to like, subscribe, share the podcast with anyone who may be interested. I really appreciate everyone who does that and also just listens. So thank you so much for your support.